Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and it's a live program that you don't want to miss. Wednesday, March 19th, and of course, I think that the range of topics we cover from the most advanced natural and functional medicine wellness to the most important prophetic and geopolitical analyses, I believe that we probably cover a broader range of topics than anybody uh, on this network or anywhere else, including even coast to coast. And of course, we are much more solid in the kind of guests we have. Uh, one of my favorite guests is Dr. Bob Teal, who's own, not only a naturopathic doctor uh, par excellence, but also a prophetic scholar. And he's made some amazing discoveries that we're going to be discussing periodically. Bob's on usually maybe once or twice a month. And uh, Dr. Bob, you just mentioned something coming up here that just as I say, good thing I was sitting down so I didn't fall down when I heard what you said. But let's, uh, without stealing your thunder, tell us what's going on uh, in the world and how does it tie in with the current events in the Bible, the Ukraine, the Vatican, everything else that's happening. Uh, what do you see? So there's so much going on. I'm really excited to share this with your listeners. The biggest prophetic thing that's been going on has gotten almost no coverage by anybody. This is why I appreciate the opportunity to be on your show today to explain this to everybody. A week ago Sunday, the patriarchs of the uh, Eastern Orthodox Church got together in, in Istanbul. And now they represent supposedly 250 million uh, uh, Eastern Orthodox. I say supposedly because a lot of these are Russian Orthodox, and Russians don't always go along with all, all these councils, etc., all these meetings. Well, they made an announcement that most people wouldn't pay any attention to because they don't understand history, they don't understand prophecy, they don't understand how this all ties in. But the announcement that they made is they're going to hold an ecumenical council. And people are going to say, yes, so what? People hold councils all the time. The whole ecumenical movement's happening. This doesn't mean much. Well, actually, for the Eastern Orthodox, it does. I've done a lot of research on the Orthodox. And by the way, uh, uh, Dr. Bill, when, I'm, uh, uh, when we're on a commercial break, I'll send you a link to a couple things, uh, including this, one of these articles on what's going on with the Orthodox with this, that uh, maybe you can put up for your listeners to get more information later. But the Eastern Orthodox Church, they think they are like the Roman Catholic Church, except that they think the Roman Catholic Church strayed and that they have the pure faith. They have the true or pure Catholic faith. That's what they teach. Right. And they teach that they are the Church of the Seven Councils. Now, if you look through church history, there are bazillions of councils. Russian, well, there's even Russians too, but um, there were Roman Catholic related councils, there were Eastern Orthodox councils, there were joint councils. But they call themselves the Church of the Seven Councils. And the last one was not very recent. As a matter of fact, the last <laughs> one, they decided That's to call funny. it a two-part one. The right. last council, the Seventh Council, actually began in 787. You're talking about not 787 after the... Uh, uh, that's uh, that's uh, Anno Domini. <laughs> A.D. Yeah, 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 A.D. Yeah, the, 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 wow. And that was the last one, but they had a two. They decided to have a two, a second part to it. So, so the second, it was called the, the seventh council was called the Second Council of Nicaea. Now I know that's confusing. There was the first Council of Nicaea in 325 that Emperor Constantine had. Then, the one in 381 by Emperor Theodosius was called the Council of Constantinople. Well, the seventh council was apparently held in Nicaea, and they call it the Second Council of Nicaea, and it's the seventh council. Anyway, they say it had two parts. The first was in 787, and the second part was in 843. Now, I don't know if any of your listeners have been into Eastern Orthodox churches, but I have. I've visited them. And, of course, probably most of your listeners have some familiarity with what the inside of a Roman Catholic church looks like. Well, this council, the last one they had, with the, they had an agreement in 843 A.D., and they call this the Triumph of Orthodoxy. What's the triumph of orthodoxy? Mm -hmm. All the idols and icons that are in the Roman Catholic churches. Or most of them, maybe not all of them. Right. They got them officially accepted by the Church of Rome, and they call that right. the triumph of orthodoxy. Now, I wouldn't think that putting idols and icons in, in your church buildings was a great triumph, but they actually, that's what they call, call it. Well, you say, okay, that's all in the past. What possible thing could a an upcoming council have? Well, this particular ecumenical council is very significant for several reasons. 
Uh, one is that the patriarch of Constantinople, his name is Bartholomew. As a matter of fact, my wife and I have actually visited uh, their compound in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, before. He said when people were criticizing him for not uh, uh, for talking to the Church of Rome, he said, look, we cannot get together with them unless there's a, a synod or an ecumenical council that allows it. He says, so don't, don't worry, people. He said this a couple of years ago. Basically, he said that those of us who were warning against the ecumenical movement, including within his own church, were basically a bunch of nuts. Okay, extremely oh, really? nuts. That's, that's a bad attitude to start out with, because if you knew what the Roman Catholic Church is about, you'd certainly not want to do that. Well, that's correct, but that's, that's a whole other subject. But anyway, right. this is what he said. And in addition to that, he said you have to have a council. Well, there was no council planned, and there hadn't been one since 843, so nobody was thinking that's going to happen. Okay? Right. But now they've announced this council. Why? And it's going to be uh, it's scheduled for 2016, so we've got some time. It's in a, it's in a church called the Agia Irene, which is an old Byzantine church building. Is and, that going to be in Constantinople, too? Uh, yes. It's uh, it, in the outer courtyard of the Ottoman Sultan's uh, uh, Topkapi, uh, Topkapi uh, Palace, which my vice and I also visited. It's a museum, and it hasn't been used as a church since the Muslims took it over in 1453. Wow. Okay? So you understand the symbolism in all this. It's like, okay... We're using a church we haven't used for hundreds of years. We haven't had a council in over 1,200 years. So this is not just some casual meeting they're planning on having. Anyway, from a prophetic perspective, uh, as, as you know, years ago you had me on the air when I was talking about a book I wrote called 2012 and the Rise of the Secret Sect. Right. And this is a book just to refresh your listeners' mind, where I warned that the world was not going to end in 2012, but it would happen afterwards. But there are a lot of things going on that people should pay attention to because these are going to line up for the end, end times, in, leading to the Great Tribulation. Well, I'd like to read you something from that book. I'm quoting somebody called St. Nelius the Murgusher. He died in 1592. So he was a uh, he, he, he was in Orth Eastern Orthodox Church. So yeah, that's why he says an unusual name, Saint Nelius. Yeah. Saint okay. Nelios, yes, the, yeah, the Murgusher. What is a mur uh, What's a Murgusher? It means he has stuff coming out of his body, <laughs> uh -oh. like mur. Okay. Okay. Anyway, yeah. uh, there's all kinds of signs and lying wonders out there. <clears throat> anyway, Absolutely. here's what he wrote. And uh, I've got this from a book, and I actually talked to the author who translated the book. She's uh, an Eastern Orthodox scholar. She was born in Greece. The book was written in Greek. Anyway, here's what he wrote in English. During that time, the eighth and last ecumenical synod or council will take place, which will satisfy the contentions of the heretics. Okay. So the Eastern Orthodox are looking forward, or at least this particular prophet of theirs, again, this is uh, from the 16th century, for this eighth and last ecumenical council or synod, and it's supposed to satisfy contention of the heretics. Now, the first question I would ask is if heretics are wrong, which is kind of by definition they're trying to imply, why would you want to satisfy their contentions? You know, we're supposed to try to do what the Bible says, not not just get along with the popular opinion, right? Just 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 to, just, just to do we're, that. We're to confront. We're to confront evil, uh, uh, spiritual deception, illogic, and uh, and to deal with it like salt uh, deals and light, right? Back in a moment. Welcome back, and uh, start off with a little bit of humor. The uh, meeting, I guess, of this conclave would be similar to the meeting of all the big families, the, the Italian Sicilian mob, not only in Italy, but in the, quote, New World in America and Europe. And they'd be basically saying, look, hey, dogma schmagma, we're all one big family, let's just get together. 
So um, even though there's irreconcilable differences, they're going to get along. And, of course, the Pope has basically put out the notice to the Orthodox Church and also the Church of England that you can have your own personal beliefs, but I'm the head of the family. Let's put it that way. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll confirm that from another source. Uh, when I visited, when my wife and I visited the compound, the ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople when we were in Istanbul, Turkey, as it turns out, there was a an American who was working there. He was a Greek American, but he was an American nonetheless. He came from San Diego, which meant he spoke English, which is really good because my Greek is really bad. So he was happy to talk to an American. And he had no idea by my interest. I was just asking, you know, what's going on with them and their church. And and, he, and I don't know if I mentioned the ecumenical project or not, but he said, you know, when Pope Benedict came over here to meet with the uh, uh, Patriarch Bartholomew, one of his bishops told us that, look, if you guys will accept the primacy of uh, the Vatican, we'll change all of our doctrinal differences to yours. Yeah, in other words, they're going to allow the priest to marry, which will deal with homosexual issue. They'll deal with all kinds of other stuff that uh, has been in the Roman Church, but they just want the Pope to be the boss. Right, and you know, and the deal about the priest being married, of course, they did that when they brought the Anglicans in a couple of years ago. Um, right. And one of the links I'm going to send you, uh, if people go to it, which I'm going to talk, where, which has this announcement about uh, the Eastern Orthodox uh, having this council coming up and all that stuff, one of the links there is an article I wrote a long time ago uh, about the, why American Catholics should fear unity with the Orthodox. And because basically the Orthodox say it's going to be the pure Catholic faith, which is our Catholic faith. You guys are going to change. But we're going to set aside some of the heretics as well. It's like, why? You either believe in the truth, you stand for the truth, or you don't. And the problem is, uh, most people profess Christianity. When it comes down to it, they accept tradition uh, over Scripture, or how they feel, or what the majority tells them, or, or that kind of stuff. And you know the guideline is supposed to be the Bible, but I, again, it was it was interesting to me when I was flat out told when I was in Constantinople that look, the Church of Rome says we'll take all your, we'll make all the changes. We don't care about the difference in the filioque clause, which we supposedly say is the reason for our split in 1054. Um, for your listeners who may not be familiar with that, the, the Eastern Orthodox call what happened in 1054 <coughs> the, the Great Schism where they separated from uh, communion with the Church of Rome. Uh, the patriarchs and the popes uh, disfellowshipped each other or whatever else. They I think they uh, mutually excommunic- excommunicated each other. Right. And then the Catholics said that none of the uh, <clears throat> so-called Orthodox succession, of, of apostolic succession that the Orthodox claim was valid anymore and all this kind of stuff. Of course, yeah, it's almost like, a, first, it's like it's like a, a Catholic... Uh, uh, early quote uh, pagan Christian Church uh, nuclear war spiritual nuclear war yeah so but but of course the current Pope and the last two popes by the way made it sound like especially as last Pope it doesn't really matter that we said you didn't have apostolic succession we're going to accept you as you are and we're going to accept all your stuff as valid anyway and that's what they did with that's what they did with the Anglicans one of the popes in the late 1800s blasted the uh, the Anglican Church said none of your uh, ceremonies are valid, your baptisms are valid, valid, your ordinations, nothing is valid. Until they made a deal with them a few years ago and said, oh, by the way, all that's valid. Yeah, your priest can be married. That's okay. So we're seeing, you know, this compromise going on. And more and more people are going to say, look, you know, the Catholics stand up against abortion, they stand up against homosexuality, so at least they stand for something. And right. my concern, as I mentioned before, is what happens when we actually see more dramatic signs and lying wonders? You know, what happens if some Marian apparition becomes public? You know, there was a over in Belgium, by the way, they claim to have a glowing Mary. Uh, hundreds of people have gone to see this. She glows at night. I don't know why or how. Okay, supposedly. Then you've got one that's weeping tears of oil over in the uh, uh, Jerusalem area. And in case your listeners were unaware, uh, Pope Francis is supposed to meet with Barack Obama in a couple of weeks, and then he's supposed to go over to uh, Israel. He's supposed to meet with uh, Patriarch Bartholomew, who's going to come down from uh, Istanbul, 
It's actually a straight flight from Istanbul to Jerusalem, by the way. I took it once. Actually, it's Tel Aviv, but it's close enough. And so these things are happening. A lot of people think, oh, you know, nothing's happening. Everything is just the way it's always been. And oh, no, we, we could ignore not. all this. But the reality is, you know, this is the first ecumenical council in over a thousand years. I mean, this is a big deal. The Orthodox finally decided that, okay, the Catholics are bending enough. We can talk. Right. Now, we can't and of course, by the day, on, when you throw also into the mix, which you've also talked about in previous shows, that they're now trying to make a dialogue with all the Abrahamic religions, which means to bring in Judaism, including modern Sabbatean Judaism that believes in the, in the perverted version of the well, Kabbalah. Yeah, they want, uh, they want, the Zohar they want, they want and Muslims too. Muslims too. I mean, this is going to be and basically, uh, it's going to be like a Walmart of, hey, uh, even atheists will have their little division in the so-called you know, greater Catholic Church. Well, well, the, just well, do enough good works and you go ding ding you reach the good hold good threshold and if you reach that number you get to heaven don't even have to know about Jesus you get there and say who's this guy oh my name is Peter I said what well, Peter who you know the guy arrives at the pearly gates the fact is I'm just being sarcastic here but the, you know the, but, but, but yeah, it gets ridiculous it's it? consistent with what Pope Francis said he said right. when he was asked about atheists he says oh if you live a good life you know you'll be saved or go to heaven or whatever term he was using and it's like, the Bible says only one name under heaven by which you can be saved, and that name's Jesus, and you're supposed to believe, well, I, I, and he's probably I like to make it even by works. I, I like to make it even simpler than that. Uh, uh, first off, you don't get saved by works, you get saved by faith in, in Jesus and God. And the reason is, your soul and the Spirit of the Most High God get fused while you're here on earth because you're here and do God's will. So in other words, salvation is marriage. That's why it talks about when you die, the marriage supper of the Lamb. The marriage already has occurred on earth, and it's sanctified in heaven, <clears throat> and, and celebrated in heaven. And so the real issue is, when it says no one is given in marriage, what he's saying is, once you're dead, you can't get married to God. It's over. And there's a death of the soul called the second death, and that happens to all those, even those with better good works than those people who are saved. Better good works doesn't get you saved. A relationship. So doing, quote, Christianity, or doing good works if you don't have a relationship with God, because the only way to do good is to hear and do God's will, not ours. And that's the whole point even of the original sin, is you choose yourself what is good or evil, and even if it looks or tastes good and passes a smell test, if it's not based on biblical principles or relationship with God, it by definition is evil. And they don't get this, even these so-called biblical scholars. It's real simple. You're married here on earth, your spirit, uh, your soul and the Most High God, and that's it. No You're second chances. Grace through faith. That's it. No actions, no good works will get you anywhere. No points. No point system. Well, there are rewards for doing good. <laughs> yeah, but it's different. That's, uh, you just get rewards, but I mean, you don't know, do things to no get story. rewards. That's why I, threw, I, better, I thought I better throw that reward to come. Yeah. They, and uh, Dr. Bob Teal, uh the, the website link is cogwriter.com, C-O-G-W-R-I-T-E-R.com. Um, let, let's tie this uh, kind of together to what the events are happening currently. We have the march of Russia to retake territory that was part of the Soviet Empire and part of Russia for, you know, up to 1,200 years in uh, the area of Crimea. Uh, it's very likely that I call it the feather duster sanctions against uh, Putin, Putin kind of, and his... Russian advisors kind of laugh at what's going on. I think that America and the West are actually standing down to back out away from doing anything serious. <clears throat> and I think that also we're going to see this link to the uh, attempted t attack last year in Syria and Iran. Uh, Russia basically is responding to the deployment of first strike capable weapon systems that can knock out a missile coming uh, from Russia uh, by putting missiles uh, in Poland and the Czech Republic. And of course, also the planned uh, joining of Georgia two years ago after the attack at the Rokai Tunnel, where the Russian special forces came in and cleaned out our special forces, Israeli, etc., and British special forces, and kind of slaughtered them because they came in and did a lot of nasty things. And the Russians, when they feel they're economically threatened, and um, the, it's very interesting to hear this about the Orthodox Church. Is that just the Orthodox Church in? Uh, in Constantinople, it doesn't include also the Russian Orthodox. No, 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 it does include them. They're in communion with them. There, there are fourteen. Right. Uh, there were fourteen Orthodox patriarchs group 
groups involved in this, including the Russian Orthodox. Now, the Russian Orthodox are not considered to be an apostolic see, according to the Eastern Orthodox. Right. But, uh, no, they're, they're, they're actually, they have actually the most members. And that's actually one of the problems I've got in Ukraine right now. You've got, in the West, you've got Catholics in Ukraine that would like to be part of the European Union. But you right. have some of the Orthodox in Ukraine that want to be a part of the, uh, the European Union, but uh, some also who want to be part of Russia's Eurasian Union. And, you know, that's another thing that a lot of people don't quite realize. Uh, you know, Vladimir Putin has claimed that, like, the biggest disaster of the late 20th century was the uh, dismantling of the old Soviet empire. Now, it would seem to people from us, like those of, those of us in the West that, no, people were happier not to be part of it. But oddly, not only did Crimea vote uh, to go to be part of Russia, in Moldova, they had a section back in 2006, it was 97.7 or 8%, it was an even higher percentage, so-called, that voted to become part of Russia. And yeah, I think that the, uh, I think Moldova and the other cities of Kirkov and uh, Donetsk and uh, Ukraine are going to pretty quickly get uh, referenda, and they're going to switch over and become Russian. Well, according to an article today uh, in Voice of America, Okay, this is from Voice of America. Let me read you the headline. Donetsk Russians say only Putin can save them. Yeah. yeah these are Ukrainians, well, and they're saying, they're saying, look, okay, Putin, you just signed in Crimea. We think that's great. You're the only one that can save us. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people think, well, the West is the answer. Let me just read one person they interviewed. He said, but, but they also view Putin as almost like a living saint. In Russia, there are people that, that don't like Putin, but in fact, he had, takes moral high ground over Obama. He's there for, you know, uh, he has a national day for conception. He wants to get rid of the drugs in Russia. He's not a drinker. Uh, he's very much for the family. Uh, there's a lot of th things about him, even though he comes from this background of being KGB, etc., that uh, even the Muslim countries see him as a kind of a savior for them because of this great demon uh, the West, including Europe and America and Israel, that's armed to the teeth with advanced nuclear weapons. And so the uh, the Russian people, you know, if they're uneasy with them, they see him as basically the only thing that's going to save their hides from this advancing mess of the European Union, which is destroying economies and pushing on them austerity fascism and, of course, moral decay. I mean, we look at Obama. The guy is giddy with Joe Biden smirking like a Cheshire cat as they have two little girls uh, on television a few weeks ago. I saw the clip celebrating uh, a number of government officials that are bisexual. I mean, how, how disgusting to have little children involved in this ceremony. Yeah, it, 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 <clears throat> but it, it's really horrible here, and again, we won't stand up for it. Uh, now, with Putin, you got the issue that he's cruel, he's, it's difficult to deal with certain things with him. On the other hand, he did take a stand against homosexuality. And I was reading something from... Well, uh, I don't, I, when we compare cruelty, I don't see him getting in Tuesday morning and saying, I really am good at killing people and sending him drones to kill right, people. No, 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 he's actually... No, I, right, he's I, actually I, I see him actually sticking to the treaty he had with Crimea, and he had backed off and said, look, I'm not even going to put the troops I have even by treaty to put in there, and yet he gets sanctioned. Um, I, I think that, that what he sees is an advancing... NATO, there's no excuse, there's no existent reason even for NATO after the fall of the Soviet Union. In fact, I don't think that Russia would pour in billions of dollars in advanced physics to develop a, you know, a, a, a arms war uh, with the West if they didn't have NATO expanding to Georgia and Ukraine, which is what their plans were. So I think that they actually were, they were actually aggravating it, uh, the situation, and forcing him into a box where he has no options. Right. He feels he doesn't really have a choice. But what's interesting, you mentioned about how people feel about him. I was reading about some people in either uh, Moldova or uh, Crimea or eastern Ukraine. It was one of those three yesterday. And they said, well, well Putin, if he says something, he actually does it. Yeah, yeah, he does. And that's, that's and it, not the same as, like, uh, like say, the health care system here or some other things or uh, politicians make promises. And it's like, well, we didn't really mean it or we're sorry it didn't mm -hmm. work out that way. And, right. But, but as far as over there... Um, let me just read one thing from uh, uh, Donetsk. It's, it's, it's one person over there. He's, he says, the new government, Kiev, is making everybody poor, and the people of eastern Ukraine can't live with the politicians of the capital anymore. That's why they want to become part of Russia. Now, the right. rest of us would say, 
you know, I grew up in the, during the time of the Cold War. I was actually in the military during the time of the Cold War. Uh, we always considered the Soviet Union a threat. We always figured that they didn't have any freedom over there. And we know they're still censoring the press and stuff over there. But, but they do censor it here, too. Here. They, they censor it by uh, economic censorship. We had back uh, 20 years ago, we had something like 40 or 50, uh, you know, uh, news agencies. Now it's down to six. And they're all owned by the same Sabbatan Satanistic. They use the word Jew, but they aren't Jews, as Jesus would say, the synagogue of Satan. So uh, in a sense, the censorship here, I mean, if you were to be a fly in the wall with Mikhail Gorbachev teaching in the Presidio up in San Francisco to the University of Stanford, you'd hear him say that you have better control of your people than us than we did in the Soviet Union. Well, the fact is they do. They have total control of the economy through the proxy of investments in local and state and city municipalities and the so-called stock market, which is privately funded by pension funds, etc. They have more rules and regulations here by a mile. And uh, the amount of corruption that's going on is far exceeds that in the Soviet Union. So, you know, r what Russia had to do is bow to the fact that America out, uh, out, uh, Sovietized, America out Sovietized their own people. Look at surveillance. Every phone, fax, and email has always been monitored. When I hear Snowden say it might be capable, no, no. When I worked at U.S. Space Command Strategic Defense Star Wars, every phone, fax, and email on the entire planet has always been monitored by our NSA. Always. Every single one. Well, I mean, this is a big building so, so, where all the data. Well, just like the uh, the uh, big giant, the big facility that uses 93 million gallons a day of water, just one facility in Utah, Bluffdale. Uh, the fact is, the most evil nation that's ever existed in history of the world is America, and the second most evil is the state of Israel. Well, right I, now, I, currently, I don't know that I'd agree with you on on your assessments of that which countries are more evil but i, will I, well, I i'm just US. i'm just taking a one two hit and i can give you a long list as to why you know uh, you know when you see the, the treatment of the palestinian people first off the palestinian people who just got parked there because they were they were nomadic until the last 50 or 60 years so they had, a lot of these people are actually from egypt and elsewhere and they just got parked in the gaza strip and then they made it worse by polarizing by removing the jews and christians which kind of act as a moderating influence then they treat it as an open-air prison so the israelis uh you know allow a certain amount of bombs and other things to get in there so they can justify doing really horrible things to the people. So, yeah, they're armed to the teeth. We know there's a direct link between Kennedy trying to stop Ben Gurion from getting nuclear weapons and the death of John F. Kennedy. So, the Israelis have a lot <laughs> to apologize for to America. They're bad guys. Welcome back, and um, Dr. Bob, in this last segment, we're going to have you back on soon again to do more shows. But one of the topics I'd like to throw out is I've talked to Mark Biltz. He'll be back on the program in the next uh, few weeks. He's um, really uh, started things rocking. There's a lot of authors followed him. Some of them are probably going off in directions that probably is not valid, date setting, etc. But if you just look at the signs of these four blood moons, and if you look at the fact that your documentation, which I think is solid about the last pope, we look at Obama, which received within a few weeks of his first inauguration the Nobel Peace Prize, we look at, at Putin, who's now considered a living saint in Russia, and he actually stopped a certain world war with an attack on Syria and Iran last year by Israel and America. Uh, we see the grabbing of Soviet territories back by Putin, who wants to restore the glory of Russia, we see this conclave coming up in 2016. Everything's screaming out, including these blood moon signs, that we're on the edge of uh, the time of trouble. And, of course, the, the time of Jacob's trouble, which is the tribulations, has to start. And as I said back in my book, Prophecy, when I traveled to Prophecy Club, to 42 cities in Israel, has to start on the Feast of Sukkot, and most probably a Feast of Sukkot, on the first day after the Shemitah year, which is the year of, of restoration that happens every seventh year. The first Shemitah year, uh, when that happens, is actually uh, September 28, 2015, on the super blood moon that can be seen over Israel. And then two weeks before that is a, is a total uh, solar eclipse also right over Israel. So I, I think that we're, you know, without putting setting dates, uh, and the next, by the way, um, date that can do that would be the Shemitah year, uh, Sakat right after the Shemitah year of 2022, 20, uh, which would be seven years after 2015. So I think we're uh, things are winding up here, and if you're just following all the signs like a checklist, and say we're supposed to be watchmen, we're not supposed to set dates, 
because God wants us to watch read until everything unveils to show that number one God's book is a book written beyond time and space which shows the author is not these prophets or scribes but God and number two to not be nervous when things happen as it says in Luke 21 to hold up your head because your redemption and not only of us as physical be beings but our don't be troubled but you know put your trust in God because he's going to restore the earth he's going to restore our physical bodies and our genetics he's going to restore all things uh, and without an intervention from God, basically, there is no hope. I mean, people need to scientifically, technically, financially come to the conclusion that unless there's not going to be a wise man or wise men or, or some organization or politician that's going to be like, quote, an antichrist or whatever, or a group of these so-called leaders that's going to bring peace to the earth. It's only going to be when, number one, our souls are married to the Most High God, which is the marriage we call, as I say, heaven starts today, hell becomes evident when the body drops away. That's how simple it is. And uh, I think that really we're looking at times here. You're a very, very prolific writer. You put a number of Kindle books together. Uh, but I agree with 99.99% of what you say. And I think without setting dates, things are going to wind down here very quickly. I mean, we are on the edge of an well, economic catastrophe. We have Fukushima. We have the still leaking at the Macondo drill site in the Gulf of Mexico with Corex at 9,500. We've got famine everywhere. We've got extreme weather. Earthquakes are increasing dramatically, just like Jesus said. Uh, in Matthew 24, everything well, is lining up, isn't it? Well, I'll tell you something that your listeners might find odd. There was a new study that came out from NASA, by the way. NASA funded this study from the Goddard uh, Laboratories that said that uh, in the industrial civil civilization is headed toward an irreversible collapse. It's irreversible. They, they say civilization, as we know it, is going to end. And... Uh, the Guardian picked this study why, why did they, the Guardian. Well, What was their thesis behind why it's going to end? They basically think that because of greed and well, they, they do they seem to put in global warming and various other things in there. Oh, yeah, they, 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 they always throw that foolishness yeah, in. Yeah, okay, but ignoring that for a second, they just said that the, the way it looked is that we, it was going to end. And Well, the Guardian picked it up, and they also the Guardian picked up a study by the U.K. Government of Science, which said that... Uh, we're going to have a food problem. We're going to have, we're going to have famines by roughly 2030. So you're talking at time frames. No, Somewhere, it'll be much faster, much faster it, than it, that. It, in it, fact, it, it may be a lot faster. Yeah, we're um, heading into an ice age right now. So uh, I think the famine is here today. It's here this year. I think we're actually uh, in the, what we call the lean years, like the prophecy of Joseph. Well, I do believe and, we're at the uh, beginning of sorrows. Yeah. And so you know the great tribulation will be coming. But again, when even mainstream scientists say, and the NASA report said, by the way, look, a lot of people that think this is a fringe or a kook idea, but this is not. This is, you know, they're really saying, look, things are not going to continue as they have been. And so those aren't religious people talking. These are yeah, probably agnostics or atheists who are putting the report out. Yeah, but um, I don't believe, I, I believe that the Bible says the earth shall remain and continue, but we need yeah. to have total recycling of all oh, of our yeah, trash. I, 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 we I, I, need I, to have, I don't we, 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 need, we don't need to be concerned about uh, carbon dioxide, but remember when you're burning coal and you're putting heavy metals in the atmosphere, 83% uh, of the heavy metals that end up in our veggies come from China and Indonesia for dirty coal. We can't think that we continue to, to use hydrofracking with chemicals and suck the water away from trees and we're going to have a forest. We can't continue to do geoengineering of the upper atmosphere, which destroys the ozone layer, and we expect it not to get skin cancer, cause pterygian of our eyes or blindness, or damage our crops. And, we, you know, as I say, we, we continue to spoil the oceans, and there's 20,000 dead zones, some of them several hundred thousand square miles in size. Uh, what we have is a situation where man has become a plague on the earth rather than a blessing and a steward. And there is a way of doing that. And first, it comes back to biblical principles. We have technologies that would allow us to have energy from the vacuum, hydrothermal energy, and other technologies. And we could have nuclear fusion, which they, by the way, hid, tier one science. Uh, the fact is that they, they want to sequester and use oil because it is the world currency. And the globalist banksters use oil as the international currency, which is why the petrodollar is sacred to America. Uh, one third of the world economy goes to the petrodollar. And, yeah, that's uh, how the U.S. has got. I, I don't. I think if, if 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 there's a spiritual change to the population of Earth, then there will be a sustainability. But when you have yeah. lies, for example, one of the things that I've taught repeatedly is not peak oil or the danger of carbon dioxide, but peak oxygen. And if you keep despoiling the oceans, you make the world get chronic obstructive lung disease, and the oxygen concentration of the planet starts to drop. It has two consequences. It causes the ozone layer to allow the Earth to be scorched with radiation, ultraviolet light which has now increased in the last 22 years to over 73% ultraviolet B, C, and D, which are toxic. 
because I was an oceanographer 40 some years ago before I went into medicine. And the second thing you're going to have is you're going to find out when you turn your car on, every time you drive even a little hybrid car, you're using up oxygen, so you're not just burning off fuel, you're burning off the, the stuff that comes out of phytoplankton in the upper 30, meters of, 30 feet of the ocean. So there's a, it, you know, you don't want to find out that you have to have uh, people living in domed cities to have enough oxygen to actually exist, which is where I think see things going. I don't see mankind cleaning up his act. We're using high intensity sonar to destroy the great whales. We're dumping poisons into the ocean, including from our naval ships and our, you know, Cruise lines are much more responsible. They take their trash and compress it and put it through proper recycling. We should have recycling tubes for every city so there's nothing that doesn't get recycled. We should not be putting out any hot toxic heavy metals chemicals and there should be no geoengineering of the upper atmosphere with you know, radioactive thorium, one in 50 atoms, barium, 10,000 times more toxic than lead, and aluminum, which kills the intermycorrhizae lichens that allow you to actually have your trees and plants absorb any nutrients. So yes, the world is terminal, and it's terminal because of the dark heart of mankind, avatar and controlled by the devil and his minions and the global leaders. It's not okay. because of carbon dioxide, it's because of the evil of man's hearts that the world is dying. There, you know, there are, as you indicated, there are carnal solutions to a lot of these problems uh, that we're facing, but the, the Bible says because they wouldn't retain God in his knowledge, yeah, and, 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 there's no can, there, there's things not, which are not I, I would, good. I wouldn't say carnal. I would say the solutions I'm talking about are biblical because they're in the Bible oh, and I've prayed on them. Carnal in terms of since they're physical. They're physical right, but, the, but I do believe the physical ones that God will put in place is, first off, the, the Messiah has to rise in our hearts before he will show up in a, in a physical representation to our world. So in other words, if we don't have a repentant people where God um, is sealed in the hearts and minds of the people, they won't recognize the Messiah. They won't recognize right. him coming back. They, well, they will actually, not even the understand him. They're going to fight against him when he when he when he. Oh yeah, <laughs> the world is going to fight. If Jesus came back today, you think his first coming was was resisted? My gosh, you just imagine how bad it would be. Now, right, he, the Bible's pretty clear that the people are going to going to fight against him. And actually, you know, uh, Catholic prophecy actually says they're they're going to fight against him. They don't. I know that's who they're fighting against, but it's it's, it's kind of interesting. They sure, they will. They're there. fighting against his his children, us who have biblical principles, who have morality, who care about the world and all the people in it because we have not all a man, a love of mankind, but a love given by God through us to the world. Yeah, we are the salt and light. And uh, I really think that the attack and the, and the great martyrdom of believers is coming soon. Oh, yes. I, I believe yeah. more of that's coming very soon. Yeah, yeah, because they can't tolerate us in the world. We are the, the great, if you want to call it, the antibiotic against the demonic evil of our world. Or Jesus said, the light of the world. <laughs> He's right. We're the light and they're the cockroaches. How's that? <laughs> they scurry away when we, when we shine the light. Uh, thank you. Amazing discussion today. That is about the conclave is unbelievable. Dr. Bob Teal will have you back on soon. Cockwriter.com.